Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. This is your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against our fighting men. War fraud. In every war, there are two battlefields. One where guns are fired and one where guns are made. We have been victorious on this second battlefield... We have been winning in our factories, our plants, in all our arsenals of supply. But there have been a few men who have fought the war of supply, not for us, but for the enemy. Because to these men, war has meant only one thing, a chance to make money. They have been caught. Sooner or later, these men are caught by the FBI. Because the workers in their plants are also working for this country. In one case, a war profiteer was caught because of a worker who was only a cleaning woman. A middle-aged woman who swept the floors in a plant which manufactured hand grenades for the government. Say, hold on there. What? Well, where are you dumping that stuff? In the trash barrel. Oh, that doesn't go in the trash barrel. But it's just the sweepings from the floor. I know, but... It's trash. Trash goes in the trash barrel. Uh, what's your name? Anna Waco. What's yours? Rockland. Mr. Rockland. Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right, Mrs. Waco. Uh, how long have you been working here? It's three months, sir. Surely you know by now that any sweepings with powder in them go in that box over there. But this powder isn't good for anything, Mr. Rockland. It's all mixed with dirt and shape. Mrs. Waco, this is my plan. I'm manufacturing hand grenades for our government. One of the duties to anyone working for the government is to conserve material. But this powder... Uh, will you let us worry about but it? I... We have ways of sifting the powder from the dirt. We must conserve. Well, I've got two sons over there, and I'd hate for them to get a hand grenade with powder Mrs. like... Mrs. Waco, any sweepings from the floor which have powder in them are to be dumped in that box. Yes, sir. After all, there's a war on, you know. <laughs> The war that is being fought on the second battlefield, the war fought in the factory, is a vitally important one. And industry and labor have been fighting it triumphantly. Soon after Pearl Harbor, however, the attorney general of this country realized that there would be a few dollar patriots to blot the record. A greedy few who would try to make huge profits at the expense of the government. And so a war frauds unit of the Department of Justice was created. And to the FBI went the job of tracking down the criminals involved. 
That's why when Mrs. Anna Waco became suspicious of the Rockland Powder Company, she went to the offices of the FBI. Maybe he has got a way of getting the dirt out of the powder, but there are other funny things, too. Like what, Mrs. Waco? Well, I... Don't be afraid, please. Anything you say is just between us. The FBI will never do anything to endanger your position. Oh, I'm not afraid, Mr. Daly. Not for myself, anyway. Who, then? My daughter-in-law. She works in the plant, on the assembly line, putting in the powder charges. But they don't care how much powder goes in. Who doesn't care? Mr. Rockland or one of his sons. How many sons does he have? Four. And they're all nasty boys. One of them's Ruth's foreman, and he just keeps saying, hurry up, speed it up. He doesn't care if the grenades are any good. He just cares if they're getting out a lot of them. Mrs. Waco, you must know the government has inspectors checking those grenades before they leave the plant. Sure, I know. Well, if the grenades don't come up to specifications, they're not any good. Those inspectors are going to reject them. I know. Well? Well, What happens to them after the inspectors turn them down? What do you mean? Mr. Daly, those Rocklands are just out to make all the money they can. They wouldn't be in such a hurry to turn out bad grenades unless they had some way of using them. Well, what way? I don't know, sir. But they're always talking and talking about conserving material. Yes. Well, good or bad material... I'll bet they've got some way of getting those rejected grenades out of that plant. Special agents were sent out to check the Rockland Powder Company, to delve into the past of Andrew Rockland and his four sons, to interview the government inspectors who examined the hand grenades made at the Rockland plant. From the inspectors, FBI agents found that each day... A large number of grenades did not come up to government specifications and had to be rejected. These faulty grenades were supposed to be sent back and fixed. But whether they were or not, the inspectors didn't know. They had no way of knowing. But the FBI had a way of finding out. The inspectors were asked to mark a small red X on each rejected grenade. And then, after a few days, a case of hand grenades made the, by the Rockland Company was given microscopic examination. Hello, Bill. Oh, hello, Mr. Daly. What's new? You mean, have we heard anything from your hand grenades yet? The answer is yes. Fine. Not so fine. What do you mean? How much do you know about specifications for hand grenades, Mr. Daly? (laughs) I've learned a lot in the last few days. Well, it seems that each of these grenades is supposed to have four individual powder charges. Otherwise, it won't go off correctly. That's right. Now, here. Look at a cross-section drawing of this one grenade. All right. Can you see Yes. That's only got one charge. If a soldier tried to use that grenade to save his life... No. No. We found 22 like this one, Mr. Daly. How many were examined altogether? 136. Oh, here. 54 with only two charges. 37 with only three charges. And out of the whole lot, exactly 25 that met with specifications. Well. That's not all. Not all? No. To be really efficient, the powder charges have to be compressed into the grenade under a pressure of from five to 6,000 pounds. That means using a machine press. Yes. Some of these were made with a hand press. You know something? What? The powder in every one of these grenades made with a hand press is full of dirt and shavings. Almost as if the powder had been swept up from the floor. Yes. Bill, let me see one of those grenades. Hmm. Yeah. What are you looking for? A little red X. Oh, you won't find any on those, Mr. Daly. What? The faulty ones made with a machine press, they all have the red X on them. The others, the ones with the dirty powder and made with the hand press, they don't have any mark on them at all. A special agent of the FBI can get into a war plant by showing his credentials. Entrance, however, is not assurance that he'll be able to see what he's looking for. That he'll be able to see how faulty grenades are packed and shipped out anyway. How other faulty grenades can be made with hand presses and dirty powder. And can be packed and shipped without ever being inspected, without ever being seen. The special agent who visited the Rockland Powder Company had no trouble getting in. He showed his credentials, he waited a few minutes, and then a young man appeared. 
Bailey? Yes? I'm Fred Rockland. Oh, how do you do? Hiya. My father's waiting inside for you. Oh, that's fine. Just a few steps down this hall. What's that? Oh, uh, just testing the burglar alarm, I guess. Oh. This way. Thanks. Oh, Dad. Yes? He'll take care of you, Mr. Rockland. Thanks. So long. So long. Uh, Hello, Mr. Rockland. How do you do, sir? You're from the FBI? That's right. Well, glad to be of any help I can to a representative of our government. That's nice of you. Uh, anything in particular that you want to see, Mr. Daly? No. No, I don't believe so. Just want a general look around, huh? Yes. Well, this building you're in now is just one of the places where we assemble the grenades. How many buildings do you have in all, Mr. Rockland? We have five. Do, uh, do you want to go through all of them? If it's not too much trouble. Oh, oh, no trouble at all. Glad to do it. It's nice of you. I, uh, I just wondered if there was anything particular you were looking for. No. No, nothing. <laughs> I, I realize you boys have to be a little close-mouthed about your business. Just but... a routine look around, Mr. Rockland. I see. Well, if you... Uh... Are those people over there government inspectors? Yes. That's a pretty routine job in our plant, I am glad to say. This way, Mr. Daly. Five buildings made up the Rockland Powder Company. The owner himself took the special agent of the FBI on a tour of all five. The agent could neither see nor hear nor find anything to indicate that Andrew Rockland was deliberately trying to perpetrate a war fraud against the government of the United States. On the surface, everything was in order. Everything was up to standard. Except that every time the agent approached a new building, an alarm bell rang. I suppose this is the last building? Uh, yes. You've seen them all now. Well, I must say, it seems to be a fine place. Thank you. We think it is. We're, well, we're all pretty proud of our little contribution to the war. I'm sure you are. Tell me something. If one or two of the grenades happen to be faulty, what happens to them? Oh, they're set aside and remade. I see. I noticed that you have special boxes set aside for the rejects. Naturally. We don't want them to get mixed up with the others. Naturally. I was just... We can uh, get out this way. Thanks. After you, sir. Thank you. And very nice of you to show me around, Mr. Rockland. Oh, not at all. I'm always glad to be of service to my government or any... What's the matter? Didn't you say you had five buildings? Yes. Well, isn't that small one over there... Oh, that one... That one isn't used. I see. That's where I originally started my plant. But it's too old to be good for anything now. You suppose I could see it? Certainly. Some other time. Oh, as long as I'm here now, I'm I might afraid as well... not, Mr. Davy. I do have a business to run, you know. I can't spare any more time. Well, perhaps someone else could take care of I around. don't think so. We all work very hard here. There's a war on, you know. Yes. Of course, I couldn't go through it myself. No. No, I think you'd have a little difficulty in doing that. Good day, sir. We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on war frauds. We'll return to this case in just a moment. At the end of tonight's broadcast, let's suppose that you open your evening paper and turn to the stock market quotations. The name Equitable is fresh in your mind, so you decide to find out what the Equitable stock is selling for. You look under the E's, but the name Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is not there. Why? Well, it's not there for a very good reason. There is no such thing as Equitable stock. You can't buy it because it doesn't exist. This society is owned entirely by its policyholders, not by stockholders. And therefore, in the very truest sense of the word, the equitable is a society in which all the funds are put to work for the benefit of all the members. Furthermore, 
the dollars entrusted to the society are employed in ways that benefit the entire nation. They're invested in war bonds and American industry. They promote the business of farming. And they encourage home ownership. By serving its members, the Equitable serves America. And now, back to the file on Andrew Rockland, War Profiteer. Agents of the FBI don't force their way into private property. Neither into a house, nor into a building, nor even into a war plant where they are fairly certain criminals are working, and working overtime. In the Rockland case, special agents attempted to get into the plant by working there as employees. The plant, however, suddenly announced that even though it was speeding up production, it was not hiring any more workers. That was also an announcement that Andrew Rockland was on guard. The FBI had no actual proof, no conclusive evidence that Rockland and his four sons were deliberately defrauding the government. They needed proof, and they knew it must be within that plant. They knew that somehow they had to get into that single unused building. But how? Daly? Yes? I'm Harvey Berkeley. Oh, how do you do, sir? Well, the boys over at the American Legion said you wanted to see me tonight. Yes, have a chair. Thanks. I'm always glad to sit after all the walking I do. And the... Mr. Berkeley, I wanted to see you because, frankly, we need your help. You need my help? The FBI needs my help? Yes. <laughs> what will I tell my wife? We'd rather you didn't say anything to anybody. Oh, sure, sure, but why me? We want to get into the Rockland powder plant. Oh. We need an employee to help us. Someone who's patriotic and can be trusted to keep quiet. We checked with the Legion and got your name. Did you check on me? We're satisfied. Well, name it, and if I can do it, no questions asked. Thanks. You're the safety engineer at the plant. That's my title. Just what do you do? Oh, pretty much what I think has to be done to keep the plant safe. You can get into all parts of it at any time. Sure. Can you get me in? Without anyone knowing who you are? Yes. Sure. What about the guards at the gate? Well, if you wear old working clothes, I can take you in with me. How? Well, I'm allowed to take on an extra man if I think I need one for special precautions. Mr. Berkeley. Yeah? Would too much snow on the roofs of the plant buildings be considered a reason for special precautions? Why, sure. If it gets too heavy, there might be damage. Why? I was thinking. You might say you needed me to help shovel snow from the roofs. There's a lot of it now. Well, I could figure out an easier way. Less work for you. I'd rather do it that way. I'd like to shovel snow off the roof of that unused old building. Oh. You see, I want to get into that building. And I think the roof's probably the best way. At 11.30 the next morning, Harvey Berkeley and a rather dirty-looking helper climbed a ladder to the snow-covered roof of the old unused building on the grounds of the Rockland Powder Company. The guards saw them, watched them shovel snow for a few minutes, and then forgot about them. At noon, Harvey Berkeley and his helper quit for lunch and left the roof of the building. Not by the ladder, however, but by a trap door that took them inside. Sure is dirty in here. Yeah, this is just an old loft, Mr. Daly. Hasn't been used for years, as far as I know. No. Nothing around but cobwebs. What's downstairs? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Let's take a look. I don't know how we're going to get down there. The door's all boarded up. Oh, I don't want to get down there. What? I just want to be able to see down there. Got your hammer? Yeah. Here. Thanks. What are you going to do? Pry up those boards? Yes, they'll loosen up. I don't know what you're up to, Mr. Daly, but you sure seem to pick the hard way of doing it. Oh, no, this isn't easy way. There. Hmm. Get a good view of the place, all right. What are all those crates? Oh, I don't know, but the Rocklands have sort of used this as a general junk storehouse ever since the new buildings were put up. You, you see that machinery right below us? Yes. 
Well, they're the old hand presses they used to use in the beginning. They're no good now, so they just store them here. I don't think they're just stored. What do you mean? Take a good look around this loft. Then look down there. Okay. See any difference? Well, it looks cleaner down there. A lot cleaner. No cobwebs, no dust, no boards over the door. That's not a storehouse down there, Berkeley. That's a little factory. But, but who uses it? I don't know, but I'm going to wait here till I find out. Well, what happens when you do? Wait and see. <laughs> For almost ten hours, Special Agent Daly sat quietly and alone in the dusty loft of the unused building. For almost ten hours, he waited. For almost ten hours, he crouched by the loosened floorboards, waiting for someone to enter the room below. Waiting to see if his suspicions were right. Waiting for proof that men worked in that room below to defraud the government of the United... Berkeley? Is that you, Berkeley? Sure is dark in here. Hurt yourself? Nah. Anybody see you come up? No, but I had to wait till the guards got out of the way. Here. What's this? Some sandwiches. Oh, thanks. You pick up that box for me? Yeah. What's in it? Shh. Who's down there? Wait till they turn on the... It's old man Rockland. Those his sons? Yeah. What have they got in that big box? Haven't you ever seen it before? Looks from... Say, that's the box they use for powder sweepers from the floor. What the devil are Look. They... I'm making grenades with that lousy powder and the old hand presses. Why those... Do you know what's in the other crate they're bringing in now? Look like grenades from here. But what for? Those are the rejected grenades, Berkeley. Let me have that box you picked up for me. Here. Thank you. What are they going to do with rejected grenades? Hey, is that a camera you got? Yes. 16 millimeter movie camera. You're not going to take... Yes, I'm going to photograph Mr. Rockland and his four sons at work cheating the government. They've got plenty to take pictures of down there. I'm glad the hand presses are right underneath. With Mr. Andrew Rockland working them and giving me a nut. What's the matter? Rockland's looking right up here. Probably heard the camera. Turn it off. No. He probably isn't sure what the sound is. If I turn it off, he'll know it's coming from up here. We've got to leave it on and take a chance. It sounds so loud. Hey, Brady. He's calling one of his sons over. Mr. Daly, if they... Shh. Too late now. Mr. Daly, there. For sure, he spotted us. The son probably told the old man he was hearing things. That's a break. It sure is. Now we're really in business. Say, these are pretty darn fine pictures, Daly. Thanks. There's a shot coming up. There. Two of the patriotic Rockland family packing rejected hand grenades for shipment. Look at the old man telling him to work faster. Oh, he cracks a whip over them. How long do they keep it up? Till three in the morning. My film ran out before then. Well, it doesn't matter. You've got enough proof here for any jury. That's all. That's plenty. Those Rocklands are a fine bunch of loyal citizens, aren't they? What gets me is that a few men like that can hurt the reputations of other patriotic businessmen. Yeah, just as one strike gives all labor a black eye. And they've both been doing an A-1 job in this war. Well, I'll leave the film with you. Where are you going? Wind up the case. I've got orders to pick up Mr. Andrew Rockland personally. Like many criminals, Andrew Rockland posed as an ardent patriot. And part of that bogus patriotism was not driving a car to work even though he could afford one. 
In the evenings, Andrew Rockland drove a car to parties and to the movies. But during the day, when he was a loyal, hard-working businessman, he took the interurban train from his house to his factory and from his factory to his house. At 5.35 one afternoon, Andrew Rockland stood on the interurban railway station platform, waiting, as usual, for the train that would take him home after his day's work had ended and before his night's work began. Dad! Dad! Freddy, I thought I told oh, you I'm to glad stay I found you. What's the matter? Oh, I, was, I was afraid you'd For left. heaven's sake. What's got into you? Dad, they're after us. Who? The FBI. What? They're at the plant now. Oh, nonsense. They can't get in if I left... They don't want to get in. I'm trying to tell you, Dad, they don't have to get in. Freddy, will you make some sense? They've got warrants for all of us. They've arrested Pete and Tom and Joe. Calm down. Calm down. I ducked out the back. They're looking for you, too. Well, let them find me. Dad, don't you understand? Yes, yes, I understand. But so what? There isn't anything they can prove. Not one single solitary thing. And until they get in the old building... They've been in the old building. What do you mean? Last night, one of them was up in the loft watching us while we worked. Oh, let him try to prove it. But he wasn't alone. I don't care how many witnesses... Dad, will you listen? He had a camera with him. A movie camera. They've got pictures of us working. Freddy. It's true. I heard them telling Pete. A camera? Yeah. Yeah, a movie camera. Dad, what are we going to do? A camera? Where, where can we go? They, they've got us dead to rights. Dad, where are you running? Dad! Dad! In every war, there are two battlefields. One where guns are fired, one where guns are made. We have been victorious on this second battlefront. Industry and labor have been winning the battle in our factories and in our plants. There have been a few men, a few greedy men, a few criminal men who have tried to defraud the government in order to make enormous profits. These men have been caught by the FBI. And if there are any others, they too will be caught by the FBI because none of them can run a factory single-handed. They need to have people working for them and with them. People who know that working in a factory today is fighting a war. People who are fighting the war not because they want to make money, but because they want to win a new world for themselves and all those who will come after them. hear about the file on next week's case in just a moment. Since VE Day, the members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, along with their fellow citizens, have been filled with conflicting emotions. We're tempted to rejoice because complete success has at last crowned our military efforts in Europe. But our deep satisfaction in this victory is tempered when we remember the gold stars in the windows of so many American homes. When we remember the boys who still face death in the far Pacific. We honor the fighting men whose courage and steadfastness have made possible one of the greatest military achievements in American history. But our hearts go out to the parents of those American boys who will not return to the homes they died to defend. So we believe that this is a time for prayer. It's a time to stay on the job, to resolve that we will not relax our efforts until final victory in the Pacific is ours. To that ardently desired end, the Equitable Society, speaking for its management, its employees, and its 3,200,000 members, pledges its unswerving and untiring support. <laughs> Next week, a crime against society. Grand larceny. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, 
and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. In tonight's case, Andrew Rockland was played by Jack McBride. The music was composed and directed by Van Cleave. The author was Lawrence MacArthur, and your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for this is your FBI. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against society. Grand larceny. There's no such thing as a typically criminal face. A criminal can look like the most respectable citizen. Beneath the surface, he may be a counterfeiter or a pickpocket or a safecracker. But on the surface, on the physical surface you see, he may look like an accountant or a mechanic or a salesman. A few criminals have been smart enough to take advantage of this fact by leading double lives, by actually pretending to be a respectable citizen without anyone knowing differently. Neither the police, nor the community, nor even, in one case, the criminal's own wife. Dan, hmm? I hope you're going to finish that pudding. Oh, honey, I, I really don't have time. Oh, come on now. How about just a little more, hmm? Well, okay. <laughs> well, the way you try to fatten me up, I'll have to start going to a gym. Well, you need your calories, Dan, with all that night work you do. Mm-hmm. Pays dividends, honey. Pays dividends. Oh, I know. I ran into Mrs. McKinney downtown today, and she said her husband said you were the top salesman of the company. Is that what she said? Mm-hmm. Well, of course you know what we get if I top all sales for this month. No. What? A trip to Mexico, all expenses paid. Daniel. Yep. Hey, I'd better be getting underway. Oh, are you working again tonight? Got a good prospect. I think I can land. Oh, Dan. I hate leaving you alone again, honey, but business is business. Oh, I don't mind that. I just don't like to see you work so hard. It pays dividends. Well, I wish there was some easier way of getting to Mexico. Honey, believe me, I'm getting us to Mexico the easiest way anybody could. Now, wait up. Life, to his community, to the world, Daniel Hawley was a hard-working citizen. And he was a salesman, a good one, during the day. At night, however, Daniel Hawley was something else. On the evenings when he wasn't with his wife, when he wasn't busy being a model citizen, he was at work in a store or an office or a shop, at work in a building which had a safe. Where the devil you been? Well, I had a late dinner. Got the blanket? Of course. And the nitroglycerin. There. Well, this is going to be an easy job. Yeah. It will. I studied it very carefully the other afternoon. Very easy. Where do you think so? Here. Take the blanket. 
thought you were going to call me this afternoon. I didn't have time. It was a prospect I had to see. You don't say. Yeah, I think a small charge will be enough to blow this. I finally got tired of waiting, so I tried to call you. But I told you never to call unless it was absolutely necessary. Well, I didn't know whether you were going to show up tonight. I told you I was. Anyway, there was no answer. Oh, we've got a new number. Oh, that's great. I suppose all your prospects know it but me. Where am I going to call if I need to? Here. What's that? One of the company pencils. The number's on. Okay. So if you think come I'm... on, come on, come on. Get the charge set. We haven't got all night. No, oh, you got to be on a job bright and early in the morning. That's right. What's the percentage in it? Three trip to Mexico. Huh? You wouldn't understand even if I told you. No, I'm stupid. I only like to have one job at a time. Well, you finished setting that charge? Yeah. Okay, let's have the blanket. Yeah. There. The car outside? Sure. Now, you know what you have to do right after the safe pops open. I know, I know. Okay, then. Stand back. can't be a perfect crime because there isn't a perfect human being. Criminals, like the rest of us, make mistakes, but theirs are more costly. And that safe which Daniel Hawley cracked with jewels for military precision instruments belonging to the United States. They weren't worth much, but just by taking them, he made one small mistake. One very little mistake, which was the worst he could make. He violated a federal law and thereby challenged the FBI. Did you get all the evidence the sheriff had, Will? Yes, right down to fingerprints. Any good ones? Mm, not too good from this last job. But there were very clear ones from some of the others. Mm -hmm. They're being checked in the laboratory now. Say, how many jobs has this fellow pulled, anyway? Well, there's no way of knowing yet whether he was in on all of them. But in the last three years, there have been 14 burglaries in that district. All safe tracking? Yes, and all done in the same way. Come in. Oh, hello, Helen. Here's a teletype on those fingerprints. Oh, fast work. Did you get anything? We sure did. Here's the file we have on the gentleman. Thanks, Helen. You're welcome. Well, seems he's an old hand at the game. Really? His record goes back to 1930. Between then and 1938, our friend was arrested four times. Oh. Petty larceny, attempted assault, burglary. What about after 38? Nothing. He got out of prison then and apparently has just disappeared. No record of his possible whereabouts. No. What's his name? Kaler. Joseph Kaler. Description? Yes. Five, ten and a half, heavy set, brown hair, brown eyes, no distinguishing marks. Just average looking. Yes, that's what he looked like in 1938, seven years ago. So about all we know is that he has a record. And the sheriff doesn't have any more on him either. Nice blind alley. Well, he made the mistake of leaving his fingerprints around. He made the mistake of violating a federal law. Maybe he's made another one we don't know about yet. Well, if he hasn't, maybe he will. No maybes about that. They always do. five steps involved in the committing of a crime, then there are 5,000 mistakes the criminal can make. Some are even made after the crime is committed. Many criminals, for example, take a curious pleasure in walking by the doors of a police station and returning to the scene of the crime in deliberately courting danger. The most common mistake is that criminals cannot stop. If he gets away once, the professional criminal tries again, thinking he has learned more but not realizing that the more crimes he commits, the more chance he has of being caught. Because he is bound to make more mistakes. Daniel? Yes, dear? Are you very busy? I'm too busy for you. What is it? Well, I've been trying to straighten out my accounts for the month. <laughs> all right. All right. Oh, it's not what you think at all. The bank doesn't add right. No. The baking company doesn't. Hmm? 
They sent me this bill for $5.80, and we really owe them $9.80. Are you sure? Well, of course, I know what I bought. Well, then what's the trouble? Well, they're a big company, and if they can't get their bills... Laura, got... make out the check for $9.80. But, Dad... Honesty may not be its own reward, Daniel, but... I wasn't oh, real. Oh, dear, but for $4, dollars <laughs> Don't have it on your conscience. I'd have it on mine. It's not worth it, Laura. It's never worth it. You mean sooner or later they always find out? That isn't the point. Oh, I know, Dad. In anyway, they don't always find out. So it's just a question of your own honesty. Daniel, I'm making out the check for the right amount. That's my girl. Just a drop in the bucket. Hmm? What do you mean? Oh, that company does a wonderful business. Harriet's cousin told me. She works in the Ohio office, the one just across the river. Huh? What'd she do there? Keeps books or something. But she said that at the end of every month, they always have at least nine or ten thousand dollars in the safe in that office alone. You don't say. Well, you can ask her yourself at the party tomorrow night. Huh? What? I, I said you'll see her tomorrow night at the party. Oh, well, Laura, about that party, I, I don't think I... Now, Dan... <laughs> I thought you said definitely you wouldn't have to work tomorrow night. Oh, but, honey, there's that trip to Mexico, you know. Oh, Dan, you said... I it... know, dear, I'm very sorry, but I just heard of a prospect. A particularly good one. dough inside that safe as you think. Hmm, why shouldn't it be? Baking company? Well, there's only one sure way to find out, and that's but. Well, how do you like that? What? Look, got a small safe inside the big one. You sure cased this job, didn't you? Shut up. Oh, come on, let's put the blanket over the little one. There isn't time. What? There isn't time. The watchman will be back again in his round. What are we going to do, chuck it up to experience? Shut up, let me think. Why are you thinking? I hope you don't mind if I just... Hey, wait. Come on. Where? Help me lift the little safe out. We can't carry that out of the building. First place is too heavy, and then the second we place... We can is... carry it ten yards, can't we? What if we can't... There's an elevator over there that'll take us right down to the basement. And then what? The basement's really a loading platform. The company keeps its delivery trucks down there. You put the safe in the truck. Okay, let's lift yes. it. Uh, not so heavy. Heavy enough. All right, this way. You know how to work the elevator? Sure, sure. All right. Set her down. Easy. Easy there. There. Now, shine your flash. What for? So I can find the starter for this. Oh. Here you are. I hope that watchman's hard of hearing. Yeah. Just hope he's on the other side of the building. Thought you said he was. That's where he's supposed to be. Pick her up and dump her on the back of this one. There. Lifting wallets is a lot easier on the back. Yes, but there's a lot less in them, too. All right. I'll set her down. Easy. 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 You gonna try? Sure. All right, slide in. Man. What? Ignition key. What? Where are the ignition keys? How are you going to start this thing? Well, they always leave them in the truck somewhere. Where? They're usually on the little ledge under the... Watchman? Yeah. Shutting his light around. Shut up. Where are those keys? Will you shut up? And suppose... All right, got him. Now, hold on tight, because the minute he turns, I'm going to move fast. Just start it. Ready? Danny's shining the light on the elevator. It's too late now. Who's there? Oh, oh, oh. Who's there? Choke it, choke it. Who's there? Come on, come on. Come on, that up. Hold on, buddy. Okay. If we pull out of this alley, we're in the clear. 
keep your eye out, Johnny, and you... Johnny. What do you know? He's got you, eh? Well, I'm sorry, friend, but there's no room for excess baggage on this trip, so... Out you go! <laughs> figure it will. I lifted the small safe out here, and then carried it over there to the elevator. Sure. Anything yet on the one who was found, Scott? No, except he wasn't the one we were looking for. The description doesn't tell it. Maybe his partner is the one we're looking for, either. Well, he left fingerprints all over the steering wheel of the truck and all over the small safe. We'll know soon enough if they match the others. Even if they don't, he's a case for us. How do you mean? Well, we drove a stolen truck across the river and over the state line. Did you find anything on the body of the other one? No, just the usual things. Keys, wallet, a pencil from some company, a bar of candy, and of course his gun. Nothing to get us a lead. Mm, nothing that looks so good. Well, I think a neat job on this place. Well, we've had enough practice. I wonder where they got the metric glistening. Probably homemade. You know, Harvey. I knew it. I knew sooner or later our little friend would make a mistake. What have you got there? You know how these boys always cover a safe with a blanket when they crank it? Sure. Well, here's a piece of that blanket. This time, Mr. Taylor, or whatever he calls himself, left his visiting card. Momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on Daniel Hawley, please. We'll return to this case in just a moment. If you believe in democracy, then you believe in life insurance. They go together. First, let's consider the typical owner of life insurance. A man who says to himself, look, I believe in taking care of myself. If I die, nobody else will have to look out for my family. When I get old, nobody else will have to support me. Men of that breed, right thinking, independent, self-reliant, make democracy work. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, a mutual organization, is dedicated to cooperation with such men, to help them make democracy work. The Equitable is owned by its members, that is to say, by its 3,200,000 policyholders. And all the society's funds are put to work for the benefit of all its members. Finally, remember that these equitable funds are so invested that they promote the system of free enterprise on which our democratic economy rests. And so by serving its members, the equitable serves America. And now, back to the file on Daniel Hawley. Peace. <laughs> which would have been left unsolved years ago can be solved today and solved quickly for one reason, laboratory work. That's why the FBI has built up its own laboratory until it is now the best in the world. Years ago, a small piece of a blanket would not have been a clue. But in the Hawley case, it was the lead the special agents had been waiting for. They sent the piece of cloth immediately to the laboratory and had it analyzed. It had the texture, the weaving, the thickness, the dye... Every conceivable element in that piece of blanket analyzed until they found who manufactured it. From the manufacturer, they found in what areas that type blanket was sold. They kept narrowing down the hunt until at last they found the only store in the vicinity of the burglaries which had that blanket for sale. Oh, uh, we don't have that blanket anymore. It's wool, you know. Wool blankets are hard to get these days. How long has it been since you've had it in stock? Oh, two years now. Maybe even more. And I guess you wouldn't remember who you sold it to. No, but I could find out. You said? Sure. That was a pretty fine blanket, you know. When they came in, I called all my charge customers and said, grab them while you can. Did they all buy blankets? No, sir. I didn't have enough to go around. My one customer alone bought half a dozen. Who was that? Well, I couldn't tell, except it was one of the charge customers. 
How many charged customers did you have then? Oh, several dozen. I see. Do you have a list of who they were? Sure. But uh, how are you going to pick out the one you're looking for? We'll pick him out. There's 34 names. I know. But I think we'll pick out the right one. Six names, actually, Well, I know. It'll take quite a while to check all of them. Yes, I was thinking about that. Of course, we have his description. Or a description of him seven years ago. And probably over a dozen men on that list could fit it. Let me see it again. Sure. Benton, Rockett, Andy, Green, Paul. That name. What about I've seen it someplace before. It's not a very unusual name. Well, no, but I've seen it someplace. Yeah. But I'm trying to remember. Holly. Oh, that name was in the local paper this morning. A salesman named Dan Holly won a contest. Yeah, I saw it too. He worked for. Wait a minute. Have you still got the stuff that was found on the other man's body? Sure. Right here in the drawer. It's pencil. Right. Here it is. Careless product. That's who that salesman worked for. Daniel Hawley. Alias Joe Keeler. Oh, we can't be sure. Uh, it's too much of a coincidence. We still can't be sure. I uh, know, but we've got Keeler's fingerprints. They match the prints on the steering wheel of that truck. And if Hawley's match, well, suppose we visit Mr. Hawley and see if we can get his prints. <laughs> down, gentlemen. This is Hawley's upstairs, but I can get her down. And oh, that's well, quite all right. There's no need to bother him. Huh? How about a drink? No, thank you. You sure? Uh, no, thanks. We're really here to ask you a few questions, Mr. Hawley, if you care to answer them. Why, I'd be delighted to, sir. Delighted. How long have you lived here? Well, let me see now. Almost six years, I think. And before that? Before that, I was in New England. Where? Oh, over. I was a salesman there, too. Once a salesman, always a salesman, I guess. <laughs> Pretty cold up there, isn't it? Yes, indeed. I was glad to get back here. I have an aunt up there now. She's just freezing, she says. Can't get enough blanket. Well, I don't wonder. It's hard to get now. Yes, sir. Are you one of those lucky people who stocked up while you could still get blankets, Mr. Hawley? Well, frankly, gentlemen, I have to admit I did buy a couple. Blue wool, wasn't it? Yes, as a matter of fact, I believe they were. Do you think we can see them? Oh, I'm afraid not, Mrs. Hawley's got them all packed away in mothballs for the summer, and <laughs> you know how women are. Yeah. I understand you're a top salesman over at Killers for this area, Mr. Hawley. Well, hard work and lots of luck will always do it, I say. Mainly luck. <laughs> do you have any cards, or do you always give out pencils like this? Here, is that one of my pencils? Here. Oh, yes, sure it is. Do you mind if I hang on to it? No, not at all, sir. Pleasure. Here. Thanks. May I ask where you got that pencil, sir? We found it on the body of a safe cracker who was shot. What? You don't say. Yes. Well, well, those pencils sure keep bad company, don't they? They certainly do. Well, I think we'll be getting along, Mr. Hawley. Ah, I'm sorry. I couldn't be more happy. Goodbye, Mr. Hawley, and thanks for the pencil. Not at all, gentlemen. Goodbye. To New York. New York? Yes. Well, I thought those two men Who, were... What two men did? Were the ones that just left. I saw them from my window, and I said to myself, Laura, that's just going to mean more work for Daniel. Uh, that's pretty nice work, honey. What do you mean? They just came to talk to me about my winning that trip to Mexico. I've got to go to the New York office first to go to some kind of official ceremony. Well, it seems awfully funny to have to go to Mexico by way of New York, but as long as you're going to get there. Oh, I'm going to get there, honey. Don't you worry about that. The 
the FBI never makes an arrest until it is sure of its facts. But at the same time, a suspected criminal is never left on watch, is never left free to disappear before absolute proof can be obtained. Daniel Hawley knew he had left his fingerprints on his own pencil. He knew those prints would be matched with those he'd left on the steering wheel of the stolen truck. He knew the FBI would soon have absolute proof. And so he packed his bag, got in his car, and drove to the town railroad depot. Wait, when's the next train? Why, hello, Mr. Hawley. Oh, uh, when's the next train? There's one due in right now. Let me have a ticket. Ticket? Yes. <laughs> Don't you care where she's bound for? What? Oh, of course, of course. Well, maybe you won't want to take her. Well, where is it bound for? Uh, let me see now. Uh, uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, New Orleans. Well, that's fine. Fine. Uh, just where you're going, huh? Yes, yes, yes. Let me have a ticket. Well, now, ain't that a piece of luck? Look, now. will you let me have a ticket or I won't make the train? Yes. I'm getting it as fast as I can. Hey, you sure are upset today, Mr. Hawley. Don't worry, that's all. I'm just in a well, here's the ticket. That'll be... Don't worry. Keep the change. Yeah, well, Mr. Hawley, don't you want the balance of the change here? Take your bag. No, no, that's all right. I'll handle no, it by... Taylor. Yes? Going someplace, Mr. Keeler? Well, I... Or should I say Hawley? You better get aboard, sir. We'll pull it out. He's changed his mind. Yes, I don't think I'll be going after all. <laughs> of us, criminals make mistakes, only theirs are more costly. One small mistake can mean years in prison. But the worst mistake a criminal can make is to violate a federal law. Because when that happens, he finds himself up against the very thing that all criminals try to avoid, the FBI. Criminals don't try to stay clear of the FBI, don't try to avoid any encounter with it merely for melodramatic reasons. They have one simple practical they know that sooner or later they will be caught by the FBI. And once caught, they will be convicted. You'll hear about the file on next week's case in just a moment. In this, the opening week of the seventh war loan drive, I should like to read an important message from Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I quote, In every war loan drive, America has never failed to go over the top. And one factor in this unbroken record of success is heavy bond buying by life insurance companies. In both the fifth and sixth war loan drives, the equitable subscription was larger than that of any other life insurance company. Larger, in fact, than any other single subscription of any kind. In the present drive, the equitable will again be one of the leading subscribers. In addition, funds of this society are heavily invested in the great industries that have broken records manufacturing weapons of war, and in the railroads that have done such a tremendous job of wartime transportation. And that is why we say that in wartime, equitable dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars for you, your home, and your country. Next week, a crime against our war effort, draft dodges. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and directed by Van Cleave, the author was Lawrence MacArthur, and your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI.
This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for Financial Security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. (laughs) 